G'day folks and welcome to this rules primer for the Grand Operational Simulation Series GOSS. This includes such titles as what you see here, Wacht am Rhein, The Battle of the Bulge, 16th of December 1944 to January 1945, and Atlantic War, D-Day 2 for days, 6th of June to the 23rd of August 1944, among others. They're the two titles that I have in this series and I'm using Wacht am Rhein as the basis for this rules primer. Now if you're not familiar with these rules primers that I do, uh, you can check out some other ones that I've done. I did a rules primer series for a time for trumpets and for nations in arms. I tend to do these for the kind of heavy complex games that I'm learning and the idea here is that I kind of learn the rules and then distill them via a series of, uh, of videos to help other new players to kind of understand the I guess the broad flow and the sense of gameplay in this game. I'm reading through the rules, I package them down into these brief videos. You can watch through these videos, get a sense of the core elements of, of gameplay, of the rules. And then when you decide, if you decide to pick up the game and read through the rules yourself, you have a, already have, kind of have a broad sense of, of what's happening. I personally find that these type of videos uh, help me to learn a game when I see them, other people do them and to relearn a game. So when I go back to Nations in Arms, when I go back to A Time for Trumpets, I re-watch those videos to get, get a broad sense of what's happening before I then dive into the rule book. So this first video uh, will cover roughly the first 20 pages of the 80 page Grand Operational Simulation Series 2020 System Rules. I am not going to talk about the exclusive rules. The scenario I have set up here is uh, Fight for Kestenik. It is scenario one in Wacht am Rhein. I'll explain what you're looking at here in just a moment. Um, but I won't be talking about the scenario rules or the exclusive rules from the title. I'm just going to focus on those broad ideas in the Grand Operational Simulation Series. Before I get into detail, let me talk about the rulebook and its style of presentation. Okay, so these are the rules that come with the game. The GOSS series rules, 48 pages, uh, black and, and white. They've been superseded by these 2020 system rules, which you can download from the Decision Games website. This is now 80 pages long, so it's almost twice the length. It includes a lot more detail, clarification, examples, and it is color, color examples. There you go. And you can see my highlighting throughout this. So this is this is a, a very heavy, complex game. This sits at the very end of that uh, of the weighting scale. I would argue it's one of the most complex games that I have played. I think I'd even argue it's the. I'm trying to think of something more complex than this. It is more complex. Just to give recent examples of games I played, more complex than the East Front series, more complex than OCS, more complex than a time for trumpets. Um, yeah, uh, more com more, certainly more complex than and then BCS. It is a battalion scale game. I believe the hex scale is usually around 500, what do they say, yards or meters. Oh, each hex is one mile of distance from side to side, my apologies. And you're principally dealing with battalions and companies. Okay, so the rule book is presented in in a sort of consultative, a sort of legal reference, um, almost like a reference style of, of rule book, where there are uh, it's 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 a very difficult rule book to uh, learn from, but it's a good rule book for returning to rules to reference and check items. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, you're, you've got, as I flick through the pages, you're confronted with the sequence of play and there's a lot of detail at this early stage. We're told about the joint air allocation, joint weather phase. We're told about construction, mode determination phase. Um, and already it's quite text heavy. 
as we flip over, we've got extended night activity, play determination, all these things that really don't make much sense yet. We then go to unit characteristics, and we're told about companies and Z-step units, um, unit steps, taking step losses and so forth, met class, static class. We then get to unit proficiency ratings. I'll talk about all these in just a moment. Um, break, then we, and the other thing is, immediately, BU company. Immediately we get to um, the the density of abbreviations in this rule book. This is very heavy with uh, abbreviations. Now there is a very good glossary at the end, which runs for four and a third pages. Four and a third pages of abbreviations. What that means is as you're reading through this rule book, you're constantly flipping back until you understand that BU is breakdown unit. Um, GA is ground assault, PR is proficiency rating, PRC is proficiency rating check, things like that. You learn these abbreviations pretty quick, but at the start, it's a bit of a rough go. So you've got all these details on different unit types, and you're flooded by this information quite early on. Um, then we go to unit modes. And this is a huge section of about nine pages detailing the five main unit modes plus some additional unit characteristics that you'll deal with, deal with over the course of the game. My concern here for as a new player and for new players is that you're bombarded with information on these unit modes and their restrictions and their allowances. For example, in particular, exploit. So where is the exploitation mode? Here we go. Exploitation mode starts here. It runs over the page, over another page. And where does it end? Down here. So two and a half pages odd to exploitation mode. And there are rules around overrun, for example. So here's the overrun combat section here. Just after we've learnt about this exploitation mode, we don't even know how movement works yet. We don't even know how combat works. And we're told about artillery fire support missions, entrenchments. Um, what else? There's all these rules being thrown at us at this very early stage, which, as a new player, I'm trying to keep in my head to then later learn about what an artillery fire support mission how it's actually resolved, how ground result is actually resolved. All these things, abbreviation MCT, which didn't appear in the glossary, which means uh, movement is something terrain, uh, movable terrain as opposed to observable terrain. All this is being thrown at you at once before we even get to movement. So you can see my little notes and, and key things to remember through here. This is still, okay, so right here we get to the end of that mode phase and we get to stacking, which doesn't cover all stacking before we finally get to movement. And this is where I'll end this video uh, in a moment. So, some problems with the structure with the rule book, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I would have preferred that the rules for overrun be in the movement section when you're actually reading about moving units. You can explain in the... In the mode section, that there is a mode for units where they can be placed in exploitation mode, or exploit mode rather, and they can overrun whilst in this mode. And then cover the overrun rules later on, where you need to then understand movement and need to understand combat and ground assault and so forth. Instead, you'll have to sort of read that section, then read movement and combat, and then come back to it later on. So yes, it is a difficult it is a difficult rule book to work through. Let me try to explore and summarize some of the core concepts from from those first 19 20 pages. Now the first thing to note is of course the sequence of play. This is an I go you go system where you have an uh, a joint pre-day game activities phase before you have the allied player turn and then an access player turn. Now you have, as part of this joint day activities, you'll have joint air allocation phase. I'm not going to go into detail on all this kind of stuff. This will happen later on. For now, I'm just highlighting that this happens. Air allocation, weather phase, joint command segment, um, has some uh, components there, and then a joint logistics phase. This is where you make your truck point determination, uh, ammo delivery, fuel delivery, Replacement point segment, joint fuel value determination phase, 
for all your HQs with uh, low or no fuel before finally getting to the allied player turn. Now you start each of your, let's say you're the allied player, you'll start your allied player turn with a mode determination phase. And I'll cover that in this video. This is where you determine the mode for each unit for the coming game turn. Usually, you're not just determining it for each unit, but in fact for each formation. And you'll determine the mode for the entire formation. And often all units in a certain formation must be in uh, the same mode, if it's a particular type of mode, which I'll talk about. You have a construction phase, which I won't talk about. And then the movement phase, which I'll cover in a subsequent video. You have an inactive player exploit phase. So this will be for the allied player turn, the German player um, and using uh, units in exploit mode to exploit, to move basically, or they can also convert eligible formations in maneuver reserve mode, I believe it's called, into exploit move, mode and move. Then we get to the combat phase, I'll cover that in a much later video. Uh, the active player exploit phase, this will be the allied player exploiting. Administrative phase where you do supply determination and ammo replenishment before flipping over to the access play turn where it's repeated. Update turn game game turn indicator then you have a night turn exploitation phase which i won't uh talk about it's a little bit special a lot of special rules for night turns some restrictions on movement extended night activity and that about wraps up the turn okay so that's a broad sequence of play i go you go exploitation and that uh inactive play exploitation something to keep in mind then we get to the unit characteristics section and there is this very handy unit type chart which the rulebook kind of refers to it doesn't really explain anything or much in here instead it says consult this chart so you'll notice we have various different types of units here and the first thing i'll point okay there's a lot of things to point out here first of all we have the the formation identification um and it's really um so we've got Formation ID on the right, these are the colored bands, and this is how it's best to group your units when you're punching and clipping them. So if I can demonstrate with my American counter trade, this is all the American units, except the breakdown units that come with the game. And you may be able to see from here that I have grouped them by division. So I've got uh, 26th Infantry Division, 35th Infantry Division, I've got the 30th Infantry Division. They're all kind of grouped. I've tried to keep the divisions as closely numbered as possible. So for example, the 83rd and the 84th. We go around here to the 80th and the 106th. The, the 90th and the 9th, they're both kind of nines. Um, grouping them in this way, because usually you'll have divisions, uh, as I have in this scenario up here, setting up in a similar area. So up here in this first scenario, we have the 78th Infantry Division setting up against the 272nd Volks Grenadier Division. All right, so organize your for your units into their divisions, and then let's have a closer look at these units. We have most common, of course, the leg infantry units. You'll note that Divisional identification, formation identification, usually division, and then there's subformation. And again, with setup, usually you have these subformations, they're regiments uh, or battalions stacking or being located close together. So that's one way to differentiate the units of uh, the formation. What do all these numbers mean? First of all, the little uh, diamonds to the top right indicate the number of steps. I believe that at most you have three steps on a unit for these um, for these battalions. So you'll have, for example, if I can find a nice example, here we have the second 311th of the 78th division, three steps. The way this works is, and it's kind of explained along the top here, full strength, when they take a hit, they become reduced and their stats are reduced. If they take another step, they place a little, and you can see this little marker here, the blue spade. It's a utility marker, which shows that they've suffered a third step. So there's no subsequent unit or counter to use once they take another step. Once they're onto their final step, you keep this unit reduced side face up and place a spade under it to note that they're on their final step. They take one more step and they're removed. The spade means that you halve 
any combat factors that are visible. So the next point I need to point out is that the first two numbers down the bottom here are the combat factors. The first number is their attack factor used in attack, and the second or middle large number there is their defense factor used in defense, and I'll talk more about those later on. The third large number is their movement allowance. You'll also notice several little small numbers here and there. On the left of the unit type symbol, you can see the infantry symbol here, you can see this is a uh, battalion. On the left here, we have their attack proficiency rating. On the right is their defense proficiency rating. These ratings will be called upon for proficiency rating checks. It's basically you roll a die, if you roll equal to or higher, you fail. If you roll lower than, you succeed. So you'll be looking at those numbers. Some units don't have attack rating. So this artillery unit here only has a defense proficiency rating of 7. That means they can't use their attack proficiency rating, and there are certain restrictions on them for not having that rating. You'll notice, uh, okay, I'll point out briefly the AT factor, a little superscripted zero up there. It's very hard to see. If I look down at the tank unit, though, the army unit down here, you'll notice that they have an armor factor, shown just superscripted next to that 12. An armor factor of 4. And some units uh, will have, for example, this artillery, will have a superscripted number next to their defense. That's their AT factor. I'll talk more about what all those various factors do uh, later on when I get to combat. Uh, what else do we need to know about these units? Um, there are some weird types of hybrid mech units, basically two formations, the US Combat Command formations, where they're a mix of uh, armor and motorized mechanized infantry. Um, we have sometimes reduced color bands. You'll notice when a unit gets into its reduced side, it goes from a full counter to a colored band across its stats to show it's reduced. Uh, what else? There are special Z step units that have certain restrictions and stacking allowances as well. We have the AFE silhouettes by type if you want to know all those details. And then unit type symbology for all that. It's probably pretty important for your artillery in particular to determine whether or not it is um, towed or self propelled. There are special rules for those. Um, yeah, and of course, unit nationalities and political affiliations. So, nothing too uh, extraordinary about that. Um, it is important to know unit size symbology because there are stacking requirements for companies and uh, battalions, which I'll get to in just a moment. But yeah, that unit type chart, give it a study separate to the rulebook and ensure you know kind of all the details on that. Okay, so the next section rule is a very brief section on unit movement class. There's a brief summary here, and there are a couple of different rules that apply to leg class and mech class units, which I'll talk about later on. But the most obvious and the main thing is their impact on the terrain effects chart. Leg move units move at different rates to mech move units. Um, yeah, keep that in mind as you're moving around the terrain. Um, leg units and principally your infantry divisions. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that there's a little reminder here, leg class units are always personnel type units. This is important for stacking as well, which I'll talk about as well in just a moment. Here's a section on proficiency checks, which I spoke about, those little proficiency ratings. Um, breakdown units don't have these listed, but there are sort of defaults for the types of units in certain scenarios. There's some information on green units, but a lot of this you won't need to know just yet. Flak units, rear echelon units, Again, probably don't need to worry about that just yet. Um, kangaroos, commandos, engineer AFVs may be scenario specific, but when you're starting out to learn the game, you can skip straight over that. Now we get to the probably the first kind of robust section of the rulebook around unit modes. And as I said, there are five main types of unit modes. Tactical mode is the first section here, and it's the main type of sort of moving around the front, uh, moving around the battlefield, 
generally a unit without any other type of marker will be in tactical mode. And it's kind of this, I think it says it's kind of the, the, the most versatile, uh, flexible in terms of maneuver and combat, sort of the, the, the all-round mode. If you're not doing anything specific, if you're not sort of planning an attack or planning strategic movement, you're in tactical mode. You can still engage in tactical assault, um, but it's not the best type of assault. Instead, the next type of mode is prepared assault mode. And this is the best mode for engaging in, as the name suggests, a prepared assault. Um, it's worth kind of reading through these. A lot of the, the rules, again, won't make much sense at this stage. They talk about low fuel, no fuel state. They talk about the restrictions on mech class units and all these kind of things. But it, it, it's the main thing to take from this is that you're putting units in prepared assault mode when you're preparing to assault. It restricts their movement. So leg units will have, here we go, one movement hex. Mech class units will be able to move up to two, although that may be restricted by terrain, by weather, and by mud ground conditions. And of course, here we go, if the HQ is in a low or no fuel state. Um, and because they're in this prepared assault mode, they kind of must participate in a ground assault if adjacent to an enemy unit at the start of the ground assault segment. So they're preparing to attack, they need to attack. Uh, and of course, the key difference, another key difference here is they can advance after combat. They get a column shift in their favor. Very aggressive and attacking. The third, and of course, when you play, when you place a unit under a prepared assault mode, you will place a prepared assault marker, which looks like this for the Allies or that for the Germans. So if you see these playthroughs of GOS games, you'll often see a lot of these floating around the table. You also place tactical assault markers on units in tack mode assaulting, um, but they are somewhat rarer. The third mode is exploitation mode, and this is where... Uh, this is a section of the rulebook that I didn't like. Um, you can place units in exploit phase to give them a chance to engage in offensive or defensive kind of reaction whilst in exploit mode. Uh, you can also, I'll talk about maneuver reserve mode in just a moment, but you can shift units from maneuver reserve to exploit mode abruptly in the case of kind of an emergency. Um, there are restrictions on what units can be placed in it is worth, again, reading through this whole section carefully because this is a, a key mode. Recon units are particularly adept at exploiting and have some benefits for being placed in exploit mode. But units can also be um, not necessarily vulnerable, but quite easily forced out of um, exploit mode. If a unit is adjacent to enemy unit in the prepared assault uh, to an enemy unit in PA mode, they'll be forced out if they retreat. Due to a fire support mission, they'll be forced out of exploit mode. If they conduct an unsuccessful overrun, they'll be forced out. And there are some other circumstances as well. Um, but as I mentioned um, earlier, um, this is one of those modes where units don't enter the mode individually. They enter the mode as a, a formational regiment. So you'll, to enter exploit mode, all mech class units subordinate to a formational regiment must enter exploit mode. So you'll do this as a whole... Um, as a whole formation rather than just one or two particular units. Um, they're, the, they're the MET class units. Uh, yeah, so units that are forced out can re-enter that, that exploit mode to join the rest of their formation. And then there are these rules on um, what you do during exploit mo um, movement. And it is it is quite beneficial, but it is it is somewhat restrictive. So you need to be careful about um, what terrain you're moving through, um, to see if it's observable, observable, observable terrain or manoeuvre, combat terrain, I think the CT stands for. Um, they are, of course, the key thing here is they are able to overrun. <clears throat> and so overruns combine exploit movement and combat. And what you basically do in an overrun is you engage in a combat on a hex and then pass through that hex, pretending that the enemy units in that hex don't exist. So it's a very unusual style of overrun compared to the games I, I've played. You basically, where does it say? Um, 
you, you ignore basically the enemy units in that hex and just move, kind of move through them after engaging in combat. There's some, it's more detail to that. Uh, so here's overrun combat section. It's effectively sort of uses a ground assault um, sequence. Determine the result. If you win that combat, overrun succeeds. You go through. If you fail, you have to back up and you may even have to retreat from where you try to exploit from. Okay, the next mode is maneuver, reserve mode, down the bottom right here. And uh, this is, well, effectively a reserve. The longer you are in reserve, the more likely you are eligible for this maneuver reserve bonus period. So if you've been in this mode for at least nine consecutive game turns, you get this special maneuver reserve bonus, which gives you, uh, in effect, where does it say, sort of, you don't have to worry about supplies. You don't have to worry. I think you get a, a six-turn bonus of this bonus period. Um, 5.44a. So you get a bonus to the movement points they can expend. You get a combat bonus of one column shift in your favor. You're automatically in general supply. So all these great benefits for being just held in reserve for a long period. Um, and again, I mentioned that if you're in maneuver reserve, you can switch to exploit mode. But they are really genuine reserves, and you can quite easily be forced out of maneuver reserve. You can't move whilst in maneuver reserve. You can't be adjacent to an enemy unit. Um, if you're targeted by a fire support mission, you uh, the entire formation exits maneuver reserve mode. So it really is a, a genuine reserve, not getting too close to the front. Um, okay, and the final mode is strategic mode, and this is principally used for strategic movement, moving rapidly across the map. Again, a lot of restrictions on what units can enter this mode, and when you can't enter this mode, if you're out of supply, on hand supply, um, fatigued, and so forth, and when you can exit that um, strategic move mode. And again, this is used for rapid, long-range distance um, distance moving. There's a brief summary of artillery units and their stance and towing your artillery. And the rules also cover combat reserve as well. And this is not a mode, it says, um, but it is almost like a special status using the combat reserve tokens. To provide you with additional benefits in combat, which I'll talk about later when I talk about combat, but um, do note that um, you can mark your, you place these combat reserve markers on your units that are in attack mode to mark them as sort of a combat reserve to give you that boost in, in combat. Um, they have to be personal unit types and, yeah, intact mode, not adjacent to the enemy, and battalion size with at least two steps remaining. If you have all these, so meet these criteria, combat reserve, benefit to um, your combat. Finally, the final thing for this video is stacking. And stacking in this game is complex. So it's just like everything else. They've um, really made this complicated. It is generally, uh, to simplify things, um, <laughs> simplify things on a two-page summary of stacking. Okay, so there are there are a number of rules that apply to stacking. Generally, 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 with many exceptions, two battalions and one company and two ZSEP units plus any, no, any other units that qualify under this special section can stack together. <sighs> Does that make sense? Two battalions one company, Z-step units are relatively rare, but two Z-step units plus any other free stacking units that qualify under here. What does that mean? Focus your attention on the two battalions, one company idea, and note that there are free stacking units. And there's a list, there's a list over here of what they are and when they can step, when they can free stack. It's not just a case that they're free stacking. They are free stacking in certain circumstances. So, for example, a one-step one engineer or anti-tank company may stack for free with a battalion-sized personnel, so read leg unit, infantry, or recon unit, 
or a two-step hybrid unit, but a maximum of two in a non-constricted hex or a maximum of one in a constricted hex. This, my advice, if you're learning, as I am, is don't push stacking. Um, or be very mindful of, of stacking. Uh, stick to the two battalions, one company, where you have engineer or anti-tank company. Look carefully to see if there's battalion size leg unit. Um, so, for example, if I can zoom up to this starting scenario, here we have, well, actually that's not a one-step engineer. I can't give an example from this uh, opening scenario, but if this was a one-step engineer, they could free stack with that personnel battalion, if they were, of course. So yes, generally, two battalions, one company, plus you may get some free stacking. Um, German AFE companies, US Armoured Cavalry Battalions, M5, for example, companies may stack for free with the US Armoured Cavalry Battalion. Um, and of course, as I said, this doesn't cover all stacking because there's other restrictions on stacking for strategic movement mode, for mechanized road movement, and I think some other scenarios that come up. Uh, there's constricted terrain stacking as well. Um, there are examples, basically, of, of what you can stack. Um, yes, and some units, the final little section over here, is about exceptions to all that. So when determining stacking for strap mode and mech move road movement, which I was just talking about, uh, you ignore these. They're not classified as being leg class units. And that includes um, in battery self propelled artillery, in battery artillery, and, and many others. Okay, so yeah, it's probably, well, probably the most complex stacking system I think I've um, encountered. And the effects are quite punitive because you eliminate anything that is overstacked. That brings us to page 20 and movement. As you can see, I don't have notes on movement yet, so I'll cover that in a subsequent video. Hopefully, that gives you a sense of, first of all, the complexity of this series, um, but it gives you an overview of those, those five modes, what they do, what they're used for, and what you need to be mindful of. Folks, this will be a continuing series. I'll cover um, at least movement next. I don't know how far I'll get through. And yeah, and then combat. Thanks, everyone, and take care.